Okay. Are we ready? It's eight o'clock. Let's start the party. Although Pam and I started about two hours ago, so we're we're loose and ready to answer your questions. We're good. We're good to go. Let's start the party. Okay. I can't listen. Um, we have about twenty-five questions that we're going to try and answer tonight. But we, I am also manning the chat. So if you see me looking over here, I'm checking in on your chat. And hi, everybody. We're happy to have you. Um, thanks so much for coming. And hopefully if this goes well, we'll have plenty more. So I'm Dr. Leonard. I am the study doctor for the CD Gem study. This is... I'm Pam Curitan. I'm the dietitian working with the Center for Celiac uh, Research and Treatment. So um, working alongside Dr. Leonard and Dr. Fasano. So we're here to answer all kinds of questions. So we hope we've got some good ones here. So we hope to get to those questions. We hope you've got some more good ones for us coming. Um, so we're going to try and, and um, hopefully answer all your questions tonight. All right. So I'm going to get started by um, we grouped a couple of questions together, so I'm going to start by answering all of the very direct sort of study-related questions. Um, and the first question that came in was that, are we looking at this study in conjunction with what we learned from the previous study, or does this study completely stand alone? So this study is based on the previous study. So in 2014, um, results of an infant study from Italy were published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And that study followed infants, um, much like this study, at risk for celiac disease. But it only followed those infants that had a um, genetic compatibility with celiac disease um, and those who had a first degree family member. Um, so this study that we're doing is slightly different because we're studying all infants that have a first degree family member with celiac disease, whether they have a, um, whether they have the genetic compatibility or not. And then of course we're getting a lot more data. So we're getting a ton more clinical information, a ton more um, biological information in terms of the serum and the poop. But we based a lot of um, the study basics on what we learned from that Italian cohort. And we're also still learning from that Italian cohort. So some of the things that we found out about the microbiome in that study, we have PhDs working on right now and sort of trying to learn about the mechanism um, such that if we find something similar here in the US, then we already have a head start on trying to figure out how certain microbes might contribute to the development of celiac disease. So I would say it's different, it's much more comprehensive, but it's absolutely building on what we've learned um, and hopefully we can compare some of our findings to them. Let's see. Um, so, we know that we're doing this study so far, and we say we, we're going to follow you for five years, and the NIH has um, granted funding for that in a couple of different ways, which is very exciting. But our hope is that in a couple of years, we'll apply for more grants and that we will extend the study. So we hope to follow um, these gem babies for quite a long time. Um, and that's because some of these infants, um, unfortunately, will develop celiac disease, and some of them will do so by age five. Um, but we know that we have so much to learn about celiac disease. Um, and we don't now know, we don't understand the natural history. So is there a peak at some age that we should then begin testing? Um, or does it happen sort of at all different times? These are all things we hope to learn. So our goal here at, at Mass General is to, you know, we have funding to follow you guys for five years, and then our goal is always to um, get data, learn a lot, and then apply for more funding so we can keep going. So I think we're trying to figure out what triggers it, why some people get it, why some people don't. So down the road, 
will have those answers to prevent celiac disease. So that would be very um, exciting. So you're contributing to, to that goal. Yeah. And that's why one of the really exciting things um, is following the infants that don't have the genetic compatibility to develop celiac disease, because no study has done that before. So we are going to be able to look at exactly what's different between kids that have celiac disease um, or kids that can develop celiac disease and kids that cannot develop celiac disease. So everybody who's participating in that study is super important. So I think one of the question was about the genetic compatibility. If you had no genes, would you never ever get it or, you know, what, what those um, genes are. So, you know, if you have no genes whatsoever, would you ever develop celiac disease? Is that yeah, so if you do not carry the gene for celiac disease, there's pretty much, there's no chance that you can develop celiac disease. Um, so there are exceptions to every rule. So we say there's about a 0.01% chance of developing celiac disease, but essentially, no. If you do not have the genes, you cannot develop celiac disease. And that's why these infants make such a sort of important um, control aspect of the study because everything else about them is very similar to the kids that do develop celiac disease. They're in the same home environment. Um, they have the same exposures. So we are going to learn exactly how much um, genes and environment contribute to celiac what disease. What triggers might be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm going to answer the couple more uh, study-specific questions before we talk a little bit about gluten exposure and things like that. So a couple of questions about what are we doing with the samples. So we are, when we do send a sample in, we take it, um, we put it into a system so we know exactly where in a freezer it is, and we um, process it if it's blood, and we put it pretty much directly in the freezer if it's poop. Um, in the stool samples, we are not testing for infection or anything like that. Currently, in the, what we're doing with the stool samples is we're holding on to them, and then um, we're doing microbiome. We're looking at the microbiome, and we have to look at it in groups because there's a lot of different factors that can affect the microbiome, and we don't want um, conditions in the lab to alter our findings at all. So we group them all, and then we run them um, at a specific time point. So we have sent off very exciting um, stools from many of the infants over the first three months of age. And we are going to be talking about um, the analysis in, in this month, next month. So we are going to have our first results from the CDGEM study, I hope, this spring. And that is going to be very exciting. Um, we eventually will be using these stool studies also to hopefully look for biomarkers, so to look for signals that someone might go on to develop celiac disease. So right now we're taking most of the samples and holding on to them. We are obviously running um, genetic tests and looking for celiac disease with the serology. And then we're looking at the microbiome, but we again sort of group them in large chunks. So uh, yeah, so that's what we're doing with the samples. So I'm gonna check in on the chat. Um, and then we're gonna move towards some, some, some nutrition, nutrition diet talk. type of um, diet questions. So we have a couple here, and if you have other questions as we go along, you know, um, let us know. Uh, there are several questions about um, cross-contact contamination, and one of them specifically, does a uh, dishwasher get the, the gluten out to, um, do I have to use separate cleaning or what kind of cleaning supplies? So. The way I explain it um, is that we're dealing with food particles. Um, we're not dealing with bacteria. So we're not trying to cover salmonella. So if you have a raw chicken on your counter, of course, then you have to get the bacteria out. You have to try and kill these salmonella bacteria. This is not what we're dealing with with celiac disease. So we're dealing with food particles. So you want to make sure everything is cleaned, rinsed, soap and water. It, you know, we're not trying to just, you know, to sanitize. We're trying to remove any remaining um, uh, gluten that may be on the product. So again, just good cleaning. Just you know, wash everything well. 
You don't have to have separate pots, pans, you know, all of those things. Um, separate toaster is needed because your crumbs do sit in, um, in the, um, the toast would sit in the breadcrumbs. But other than that, just good basic washing. So, dishwashers. Right. So again, just good cleaning. Good cleaning. You don't have to, you know, I, I tell people you have to be thoughtful. Um, you have to plan, but I don't want you paranoid or fearful. Um, again, just common sense, good cleaning um, will help with that. Um, so those kinds of things, then, um, then a little bit about the um, introduction of gluten into the diet. And I think there's been enough studies done uh, to show that there used to be considered a window that you had to introduce gluten between four and six months. If you did it too early or too late, that increased the risk. Um, and we did not, through these uh, earlier studies, um, that this was not the case. So there isn't um, a magic um, window that you have to introduce gluten in. So we follow the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines for introducing foods, the same that we would for, for kids not at risk of celiac disease, um, to again, to begin to, to introduce those, those foods to kids, to put, put it in their diet. Um, so there's no reason to, to, to um, restrict or withhold um, gluten for a year or, or anything else. Um, in general, there, the whole thinking about allergens, which again, celiac disease, as we all know, is not an allergy. It's an autoimmune uh, condition, so it's an autoimmune disease. It's not an allergy. But there were some questions here about allergens. So you may be aware of recent studies about even for peanuts, that they're saying that maybe we got this wrong. Instead of delaying the introduction of peanuts, we need to introduce it early. So the, so the microbiome have a chance to see this and say, oh, you know, okay, now this is not an invader. This is an okay thing, so we're not going to have an allergic reaction to it. So if anything, the, the studies are looking more for early introduction rather than delayed introduction. And I know there was a specific question um, about um, one recommendation may have been to withhold all solids. And I may be reading this wrong without my glasses here, that um, you delay all introduction of food until one year. And I do not recommend this whatsoever. So um, formula or breast milk is fine for the first six months, but then we do need to introduce solids into the diet, not only nutritionally, but also just for motor skills. You know, kids need to eat. They need to, they, they need to develop those motor skills. They need to eat. They need to get the digestive system running and up and running. So withholding food for the first year is, is not, um, not what we would consider medically necessary. And everything that sort of we're learning in allergy research is that the more proteins that an infant is introduced to at an early age, the better. The so better. we really want to offer as many foods as possible, um, you know, after four months. And again, it's different. Celiac disease is not an allergy. So um, there was a study also in 2014 that gave tiny amounts of gluten to kids um, to see if they would have a decreased chance of developing celiac disease. Again, these are kids at risk. They have a family member. They have the gen genetic predisposition. They didn't find that there was any difference in the kids that were fed the tiny amounts versus none. Um, but overall, we think that the more proteins, the more foods that an infant is exposed to, the more that their immune system sees and the higher chance that they'll be able to tolerate those things. So we certainly want to encourage people to um, introduce solid foods. And we usually say, you know, the way that the American Academy of Pediatrics suggests. Yes, so that exactly. means there's no difference, right? So, um, every you know, again, they recommend fully exclusively breastfeeding or, you know, again, um, mm -hmm. you know, if you can't breastfeed, then bottle feeding for six months and then the introduction, the introduction of food. There's some, con you know, uh, talk about what you introduce first and, and really uh, you're looking at what nutrients do the babies need. And one of the things that they need is iron because their iron stores are depleted after about six months and breast milk can be low in iron. So starting with iron fortified cereals is generally the traditional um, way to proceed, you know, with the rice uh, fortified cereals. Um, but you can do meats too. But some physicians are saying, well, wait a minute, if we need iron, we need a good source of iron. So let's introduce the meats first. So let's start with the meats and then move on to fruits and vegetables and those types of things. So really, you know, like, you know, Dr. Leonard said, you need a variety of foods. Um, the microbiome loves a lot of healthy whole diversity. grains, diversity, lots of vegetables and fruits. And, you know, those are the things that are going to build a healthy gut. Yeah. 
Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Um, Wait, we have one that oh. will say someone um, is saying that their son was diagnosed with milk soy protein intolerance and they want to wait. They were su someone suggested to wait a year um, to introduce dairy, soy, and gluten. So I would say I'm going to disagree with that. Yeah. So if, if you're diagnosed with, um, you know, through um, some some uh, have endoscopies and we've got the eosinophils that, you know, that's, that's, is that what they're No, this, the is like a, this sounds like a milk soy protein intolerance. I'm going to say it's an infant um, less than, it's, yeah, less than a year. So for one, I would say there's no need to um, not introduce gluten that doesn't have anything to do with the milk and soy intolerance. Um, and then two, um, so I would say introduce gluten. And then two, what we do at Mass General and every he does it a little differently sometimes there's the art of medicine um, is that we generally give it another try so if your infant um, is close to six months depending on when this happens so if he they've been doing well for two months or so we generally suggest introducing a tiny amount of milk um, in the form of either like a baby yogurt or it could be baked milk or a little teeny bit of cheese or just a little bit of um, cow's milk formula and we usually try it at six months and if if there are symptoms symptoms like blood in the stool um, or terrible rash but really if it's a little bit of diarrhea we keep going um, and then if that doesn't work we try it again at nine months so our goal is really to try and get that protein back into the diet this is not I'm saying this for cow's milk protein intolerance and not for an anaphylactic reaction that is completely different and that should be managed by an allergist but if you have a cow's milk protein intolerance again everybody does it different I would say a couple of years ago we said don't try it again until one year of age but now the research shows that the sooner that you uh, get those proteins back into the infant the the higher chance that they're going to tolerate more protein. So we try at six, between six and nine months, and we try every couple months to get that protein back in there. But just keep in mind that we're kind of mixing apples and oranges here. So yeah. we're, we're talking about yeah. celiac disease and the gluten versus the, the protein. So it's very, the top eight allergens, and so wheat happens to be one of the top eight allergens. So sometimes if they do have an allergic reaction that they're, that they're looking at sometimes they do remove some of the top eight allergens weed being one of them for an allergy purpose right not for celiac disease right. so again keep in mind that we're kind of mixing right mixing it up and then here. cow's milk protein intolerance is not a true ige mediated allergy, allergy. so that's an intolerance which infants all often outgrow so we're talking about a lot of different things and it does get complicated so I would say talk to your doctor but if it's a cow's milk protein intolerance there's no need to remove gluten from the diet and talk to your doctor about seeing if you can do a very sort of light uh, milk challenge sooner rather than later question coming in about blood in the stool and a rash by six weeks with milk and soy allergy um, we and whether that's an autoimmune reaction. As far as we know, it's not an autoimmune reaction, but we don't know yet. Um, we are doing research at Mass General to look into that further. But as of right now, we do. it's not autoimmune and it's not an IgE-based allergy. Um, we don't know exactly what causes it, but we know that most kids outgrow it and there's ongoing research. So I'm hopeful that in the next couple of years, we'll be able to tell you sort of exactly what's going on there. So, uh, one of the questions, um, again, kind of, kind of common, um, does everyone with celiac disease have the same threshold for gluten exposure? Um, and we talk about the 20 parts per million. So sometimes that needs a little bit of explanation as well, how we came up with this 20 parts per million and how the FDA came up with 20 parts per million. So in studies that have been done, it has been shown that the vast majority of people with celiac disease can tolerate a daily exposure of 10 milligrams per day. So uh, we're so close. Yeah, we know. Oh. I could kick you under the table here. So she's going to kick me if I say anything wrong. So, so how do you distribute that? So we know that 10 milligrams, 10 milligrams is about the size of an eighth of a teaspoon of flour. So if you think about that much gluten exposure, the vast majority of people with celiac disease can tolerate that daily exposure. So we take that little bit, 10 milligrams, and now we're going to distribute that throughout the day. So that's going to be 
sprinkled, if you will, throughout your food. So how much food could you eat before you reach this 10 milligrams a day level? So if your food contains less than the 20 parts per million, so again, if you think of 20 grains of sand in a million, you know, in a big pile of sand, um, that's the level that we're looking at. Um, you could eat over two pounds of gluten uh, free food, so gluten free pasta, gluten free bread, gluten free cereal, um, eat over two pounds of that, and you would still not get over that 10 milligrams. So we consider the 20 milligrams safe. So, and to back up a little bit, so in Europe, bef before we passed our laws here, many, many years before, the, the codex used to be 100 parts per million. What's the codex? Codex is the FDA version of standards okay. in Europe. Got it. So um, many countries followed 100 parts per million. And that worked because they didn't eat much of the products. So they didn't eat the two pounds. They only ate a pound or a quarter pound. They didn't eat a lot of the gluten-free foods. So they ate less and they had more exposure. But they did not exceed then that 10 milligrams. We do have people that come to us <laughs> that do follow a very strict gluten-free diet. They follow the rules. No, they don't eat the pound uh, whole loaf of bread at one time. So they, they follow the rules. They're very strict. They're very good about cross-contact. They keep within the frame, but they're still having trouble getting their celiac disease under control. So TTG re remains elevated, or they still have symptoms, or they still have damage on biopsy. So that special group, um, we put on a very special diet, which removes all processed foods. So we take any contamination out of the diet. So we take any processed food, including gluten-free food, out of the diet completely. And we give the immune system time to rest. Um, they just have a very active immune system. So what happens after three to four months on this special diet, their immune system does calm down, their TTG comes down, and they do get gut healing then they return to that normal gluten-free diet. So everybody goes back to the normal, if you will, traditional gluten-free diet, which includes those types of products. So I don't think people are more sensitive um, you know, than others um, because we just don't see, we just don't, and the amount of patients that we yeah. see in our clinic, we just find very few that will, and, would not be able to tolerate them. And we know that some people have symptoms when they eat after going on a gluten-free diet, some people have symptoms when they eat gluten and some people don't, but that whether you have symptoms or not, right. something, the inflammatory response is still developing in your intestine and you may not have symptoms for years or you may have symptoms immediately. So we also see patients in our clinic that come in and say, I was diagnosed with celiac disease um, and then I started eating gluten again and I have felt fine ever right. since. Mm -hmm. And then we do labs and we see that they have vitamin deficiencies up the wazoo, as Dr. Fasano would say. Um, and we right, do a right. scope, and it's still there. So um, if you are cross-contaminated, you may not develop symptoms, but it still could be harmful for your body. So that's why we all have to be so very careful. And why follow-up is so important. So as, as Dr. Leonard is saying, you can eat gluten and have no symptoms. Or you cannot eat gluten and have symptoms. You know, sometimes um, people who don't realize they have a lactose intolerance. So they find a good cereal that they like and they eat a lot of uh, cereal one morning. And then they're having digestive problems. So gas, bloating, diarrhea, not because they had gluten, but because they have a lactose intolerance and they overdid the lactose. So there's other things that could be right. um, at play as well. Like too much fiber. Oh, right, exactly. Remember that? that there's that a really pasta that's made of all beans. I didn't do this, but I've heard <laughs> that if you eat the whole, whole box, box. <laughs> that it, it's like three days worth of fiber and that can cause gas and okay, bloating. Your body doesn't like that. <laughs> it doesn't like it when you overdo uh, anything. So yeah. uh, it's an excellent product, but don't eat it all in one setting. Should we, um, I'm going to answer one question and um, then should we talk about probiotics and then we'll get into genetics. So mm -hmm. one question was, will we share the results um, of this of what we find out this spring, um, and the answer is yes. As soon as um, we get enough information and analyze it, we will share it with you um, either probably through one of our one of those updates that we send. Um, but I'm hopeful that we'll be able to send that out to you guys as soon as we have any information. Um, and the other question that came in that was on our group, so I'll, I'll answer it now is. Um, 
are we talking to other GI doctors about all of these things and um, about how to care for patients with celiac disease? And the answer is absolutely. Um, we, Dr. Fasano and I, um, speak all over the place. Um, as does Pam, we have information on our website and we're constantly um, trying to spread the word about sort of best practices for celiac disease. Um, so we're always trying to get the word out and we're happy to come speak to whoever will listen. We talk to anybody who anybody. listens to us. Anybody. Okay. Probiotics. Um, so um, would you recommend any particular brand of probiotics? And again, we're not, we're not, Big advocates of probiotics. Um, we don't recommend them a whole lot. Um, we, of course, we always start with food. So you always want to start what, back to what we were talking about earlier. So the healthy foods that feed the microbiome that they really like. Um, you know, the they love fruits, vegetables, um, whole grains, and so. And then um, things like yogurt, which are, are um, ferment and any fermented foods like yogurt or kefir, um, those are the types of things that help to establish um, our healthy gut bacteria. But we really, you know, we're kind of on the verge of this. So there's many, many different strains. So it's not just one strain. Like this, this is the good strain and this is the bad strain. There's, you know, all different kinds. And so which one do you feed? Which one do you don't feed? And do you overfeed this one? And while the other good one isn't getting fed and then they, you know, suffer. Yeah. Um, we know the microbiome does not like sugary things. They don't like the sugary simple carbs. Those types of things are good for the microbiome. But as far as adding the probiotics, I think I don't think they're harmful per se, but I don't necessarily recommend them as a replacement for what the basic good eating we should be doing. Yeah. So I wrote um, a blog that's going to come out in the next week or two, and we'll post it on the Facebook page about should patients with celiac disease uh, take probiotics. And what I wrote about was sort of some of the research that's been done. Um, and what it looks like is exactly what Pam said. We don't understand enough about the microbiome um, to know what bugs we should be, you know, putting into our system. We know that a diverse, so having a lot of different microbes is good. And the best way to make sure you have a diverse microbiome is to have a diverse diet. And so that means eating things that have na that are natural prebiotics and natural probiotics. So just like she said, kefir, yogurt, prebiotics are like chicory. Um, there's there's lists out there. And so we ne we don't often recommend probiotics because many there are a couple of strains, you know, zero one to eight strains, and we don't know what overwhelming our system with one to eight strains is going to do. What if there's like a little group of microbes that are so important, but when you give a whole bunch of lactobacillus GG, it's probably not going to happen. But what if that one, what if those go away? Right. We just don't know yet. So I would say eat a healthy, diverse diet. Um, and there's no need to supplement with probiotics until we have any research that shows that it's helpful. Okay. Um, so the this blog is coming out on Kevin MD and maybe in the Huff Post. Um, so I'll make sure to send it onto the Facebook group and maybe come up with a blog um, eventually. But right now there's no website for it because <laughs> I just do it sporadically. Um, okay. Want to talk a little bit about genetics, and then we can talk about some um, treatments that are in the pipeline for celiac disease. Because I was trying to answer a couple more questions. Yep. What do you think? Okay. Yep. Um, so let's get to some genetics because I know a lot of genetic tests went out, and there were a lot of questions. Um, so we already said if you don't carry the gene for celiac disease, you essentially cannot develop celiac disease. Um, if your infant has the genetic markers for celiac disease. Um, I will say that that was expected. That's why you're in the study. We know that at least 75% of infants born to a family with celiac disease will carry one or both of the genetic markers. Um, we also know that at least 40% of the population in the United States carries one of the genetic markers. But the majority of people with these genetic markers don't develop celiac disease. So. 40% of the population carries one of these genetic markers, only um, that two or 3% actually go on to develop celiac disease. And so that's what we're trying to figure out with this study is what 
pushes those two or three percent into developing celiac disease. The genetics are so important, they're absolutely necessary in order to develop the disease, but um, there's has to be some other really important things to decide why 3% go on to develop celiac disease. So right now, um, the research that's out there really shows that kids who develop celiac disease, when we follow them prospectively like we're doing, so when we test every couple of years for celiac disease, we pick them up and that not they don't often have like Sometimes they have the typical symptoms, but not always. So um, one of the questions is, so what should you watch out for? I would say um, you want to watch out for any sort of change in growth. So if the child isn't growing as well as they usually are. But otherwise, if right now, if you, there's a strong family, if there's a family history of celiac disease, um, we need to test every couple of years. So that's covered by being in this study, but for other kids, uh, we usually say every three years or so, maybe like age three, six, and then nine before puberty starts, and then you could go every every couple of years after that. Yeah, I gotta say too, if you're gonna do blood work, throw a TTG in. You know, if you're, if you, if you're doing, um, you know, blood work for, if you automatically do lead testing or iron or you know, regular physical, whatever you're doing blood for, throw a TTG in. And it does not matter about symptoms. So we have seen children in clinic who, um, the brother was diagnosed with celiac disease, classic, you know, he had the GI symptoms, the stunting, the growth, all this kind of stuff. His brother, on the other hand, not a, he was tall, he was growing well, great appetite, no GI symptoms. No physician would ever think of celiac disease taking a look at this kid. But because his brother was diagnosed with celiac disease, he was screened. Sure enough, TTG is over 100 Marsh 3C on, uh, on the endoscopy. So he hadn't progressed to where he had symptoms um, and the damage hadn't had progressed to the point where he was you know, having problems, but he definitely had um, problems with his, you know, problems with celiac disease. So sometimes physicians say, well, we don't need to test because, uh, you know, you, you don't have any symptoms or you don't have any. But, right. but again, keep in mind, this can occur at any stage. And, you know, parents should be um, screened. So every couple of years, again, if you're in for your physical and you're doing the cholesterol test, throw a TTG in. You know, it's not, I'm not asking for an endoscopy every year, just a simple TTG will do. Right. Um, so a couple other genetic tests. So um, again, so for every child that is in a family with celiac disease, there's a 75% chance that they'll carry one um, or both uh, HLA DQ2 or DQ8, that they'll be at risk. Again, that, that information comes from Italy. Um, we expect it to be the same here. And that's essentially what we found with the first 100 gems that we've looked at. Um, you can have genetic testing done for other kids not in this study. Um, generally, I think it's difficult for pediatricians to send, but um, they possibly could, and gastro pediatric gastroenterologists can send it as well. Um, right now, it's not covered by insurance. And not always. You just have to. Right, but for infants who's otherwise. Yeah, just be careful. Um, Before you get the test done, depending on where you do it and who does it, and just be sure you know ahead of time if your insurance is going to cover it. That I think some insurance companies are doing better, but it can be up to a thousand dollars. And yeah. who wants a thousand dollar surprise? Yeah. So just be sure that you know if it's covered or not. I've only heard of insurance that's covering it lately if there's a positive TTG, a positive blood test, and a negative endoscopy, or vice versa, a positive endoscopy and a negative blood test. They'll cover it when test findings are discrepant, but I have not seen them cover it. Um, in other ways, so you're looking at about a thousand dollars. Let's see, and let me ask about again. I think we touched on what ages should we test children for the antibodies um, for celiac disease. Again, we said every three years or so, whenever they're getting blood work, um, or if anything unusual is happening. Yeah, and then someone asked whether. Um, we can test for celiac disease or gluten intolerance in the stool, and we cannot. There's no stool test for celiac disease that is validated, um, period. I think there are some out there. Um, I don't know what they're testing. We don't have any that would do that. We are working um, with some cool companies to try and be able to monitor whether you've been exposed to gluten um, through the urine or 
poop. Oh. And so that's going to be exciting. But right now, there's no way to test for celiac disease in the poop. And what we're doing is we're hope, we're looking at the microbiome to look for signals that might um, tell us that someone is going to develop celiac disease. And there is no biomarker at all for gluten intolerance. Uh, right. So while we're on that on that on that subject. So um, unfortunately, we have no biomarker for gluten. So you may not have celiac disease, but somebody in the family may be gluten sensitive, or they just can't tolerate gluten. Um, it's unfortunately at this point a rule out. So if we know you don't have celiac disease, and we know you don't have a wheat allergy, but you really cannot eat gluten uh, without symptoms. Um, that's our only diagnostic criteria at this point. So please, a lot of labs will say, I've even seen where they'll test for the gene for gluten intolerance, and that's news to me because I didn't think we had one. Um, so, um, or, you know, or another <laughs> the, the gluten intolerance gene. <laughs> I was like, well, Larry, do a special gene testing in the lab for zonulin genetics, but that's different. Yes, that's that's total permeability. <laughs> that's different. That's We're not, not going right. there. That's not, right, exactly, exactly, exactly. Okay. Um, Okay, I want to come back to probiotics for a minute because we, um, I said that we don't suggest probiotics for patients with celiac disease, but there are, um, and that's kind of going based on strict evidence. Um, again, we don't think that they're harmful, but we don't know that they're helpful, and for that reason, I tend to stay away from them. Um, but there are studies that show that if your child is on antibiotics, that starting a probiotic at the same time um, is helpful to decrease the length of time of antibiotic-associated diarrhea. So that's a direct um, proven relationship. So I can see using, I would say that you should use that if your child goes on antibiotics or you can consider that or it's fine to do so. Um, sometimes I tell patients to just increase the yogurt or keeper and, and do it in that sense. but. Probiotics are helpful when a child or anyone is on antibiotics. Probiotics have been shown to be helpful if you are a woman in your third trimester of pregnancy and you have children that have asthma or atopy, um, eczema. So taking um, lactobacillus GG in the third trimester can possibly decrease um, the chance of eczema in your child, at least for a short time. And then there's one other um, study that shows that if you have ulcerative colitis, which is a type of inflammatory bowel disease, and you have a specific um, inflammation in a certain part of your colon, then taking BSL number three is helpful. So again, there are studies that are coming out and um, finding that specific strains may be helpful for specific diseases or conditions, but we don't have any of that information for celiac disease. And we do sometimes have um, some studies that show that even if you take a, one of the celiac studies that came out showed that when they looked at the microbiome of people that took the probiotic versus the ones that did not, um, there was no difference. So they thought that particular probiotic didn't make it through the acid of the stomach. So that's why I just think it's it's early to... Um, and they're not just a temporary thing, though. I mean, it is for a condition like if you have the diarrhea, but but if you know once you stop taking them, then whatever you're feeding, bye, bye. You know, so we're you know, as so. Tori would say, "Girl, bye." <laughs> so you know. Okay, it, maybe I say that. <laughs> okay. Um, the and the test for doing a TTG every three years or so so should be covered by insurance. Um, okay, I think we answered the genetic questions. Unless, um, yeah, I think we answered the genetic questions and the study-related questions. Probiotics. I'm going to look over here. You, do you want to touch on any of those? Um, someone asked about whether there's any data on celiac disease um, and correlation with ADHD. <clears throat> so there's one study that looked at celiac disease and ADHD. It didn't find any um correlation. I think that we sometimes look for nutritional deficiencies in kids with celiac disease um, to see whether that might be affecting behavior. And so certainly a child with undiagnosed celiac disease or recently diagnosed celiac disease could, I think, not necessarily have a relationship with ADHD, but could have some um, difficulties in school. And that's because they don't 
feel well. So that could be misconstrued um, as ADHD. And so I think if there are behavior changes, one of the things that you want to consider is could this be related to celiac disease? There is a question about vaccinations too with the um, celiac disease. And we do highly recommend all the vaccines. So please, yes. um, uh, even flu vaccines, all the vaccines, um, there's no reason. Some people think because you have an, a compromised immune system, you shouldn't get vaccines. No, you definitely need, we definitely recommend all the vaccines. So keep all the vaccines. And there were new recommendations out this year that if you have celiac disease, um, that you should have your status to hepatitis B um, checked because you might not have mounted an immune response to hepatitis B. So that's for all of our celiac patients that haven't had that done recently, we're doing that, and that's part of the new diagnosis workup at this time. So um, just pass that on to your friends and family that you might need your hepatitis B status checked. There you go. I don't know. Um, breast milk uh, versus formulas. Um, again, um, breast milk is best. We will always recommend breastfeeding. Um, unfortunately, it did not have the protective factor that some of the earlier studies thought it did. So we thought by introducing uh, gluten at the same time as breastfeeding would offer a protective factor. Um, it did not. So although breast milk has numerous um, beneficial um, um, uh, things for, for kids, and we highly recommend breastfeeding, it does not help prevent celiac disease. Okay, one thing before we can end, maybe on, I'll just tell you a little update on um, treatments in the works for celiac disease or some new cool stuff coming out. Um, but one thing that I do want to get across about the celiac disease testing about the TTG and the DGP and all the serology blood tests for celiac disease, um, every lab has a different cutoff. So sometimes a positive TTG is four and sometimes it's 16 and sometimes it's 22. Um, so every lab makes a different cutoff. So we really just look at whether it's positive or negative and then we look at, we want to know sometimes how high it is. That's not always that helpful except if it's greater than 10 times the upper limit of normal. We think pretty that's, pretty that's pretty high. There's cutoffs that are positive and they're different. Look at your hands going over there. And there's, <laughs> it's different based on the lab. That means when it's negative, after it's negative, we don't care about the number. So if it's zero versus, if the cutoff is 15, so above 15 is positive, whether the number is two, zero, eight, 12.2, none of that matters. That's all negative. And that's because the way that the tests are validated in the lab just means that they can only, we can only know that something's true above the cutoff. So please don't, if you get um, results from us and the cutoff is 15 and it's 13 and the last time it was two, that does not mean that um, your infant or your child or anybody is headed towards celiac disease. The same is true if you have celiac disease and you are tested every year with your TTG and one time it was 12 and the next time it's 12.5, that does not mean you are exposed to gluten. The lab tests can only, they have to find a cutoff for where they're validated for where we can say we trust the results and anything below that is just negative. So please don't look at that number and draw conclusions from that because we can't. That's why positive or negative. Um, thing, so one is um, what do we recommend for follow-up after a gluten-free diet? So for kids 10 and older, um, kids and adults, after one year on a strict gluten-free diet at Mass General, we're recommending repeating an endoscopy between one and two years and doing a blood test at the same time. If the blood test and the endoscopy are normal, meaning there's no damage, celiac disease in remission, we'll follow a TTG every year right now. And that's only because even though we don't think it's very helpful, if it were to go up, we would be concerned. Um, we also want to follow growth, how you're feeling, and nutritional parameters. We don't recommend any more than one endoscopy unless something changes, whether that's your symptoms or your TTG. So you should be seeing a, a gastroenterologist and a dietitian yearly to check in on how you're doing. Um, I think, yeah, if any adults that are 
you know, have been diagnosed with celiac disease again, it's it's within the last, I'd say, four or five years that we're recommending this follow-up endoscopy. So if you were diagnosed 10 years ago, you probably never had that repeat endoscopy, but studies are really showing that even though you have a negative TTG and your symptoms may resolve, you still may have intestinal damage. So I think it's a recommendation we're making for everybody as, as you said, over the age 10 to get that repeat endoscopy to verify that your celiac disease is under good control in, in the admission. Yeah. All right, so we'll wrap up. If there's any burning questions, send it in now. Um, but I'll wrap up by saying, you know, right now there's no cure for celiac disease. It's an autoimmune disease that can be put into remission, meaning symptoms should go away, blood tests should return to normal, intestinal damage should go away if someone, in the most cases, is on a strict gluten-free diet. We're finding through research that Anywhere up to 30% of patients with celiac disease may still have symptoms or signs of celiac disease, or they may even have um, intestinal damage in the small intestine, despite being on a gluten-free diet and doing their very best. Mm -hmm. um, so people are now more and more researchers and industry are looking um, really to move towards looking at biomarkers. So can we look for intestinal damage without doing an endoscopy. So that's something we're looking at too. Um, right now, our studies have to include the endoscopy because that's sort of our gold standard, but we are taking urine and poop and blood um, and questions and we'll take anything to try and see, can we find a marker in the urine or the poop that tells us that there's still intestinal damage or someone's been exposed to gluten so that someday we don't have to do endoscopies. So that would be, um, something exciting. There are a couple of different industry people that are looking into different possible treatments for celiac disease. Um, there was an enzyme that was trying to digest gluten before it got to the small intestine. As you guys probably know, no one can completely digest gluten. So there's been lots of different like mixes of enzymes that can that try and digest it completely before it gets to the small intestine. That one um, came out like a month, maybe a month ago that it failed. Yeah. It's very hard to digest gluten, and these people have worked on it out like a decade. So if you see something on the market oh right my now, gosh, yeah. so don't, don't, it's it's it doesn't gluten work. Gluten 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 something. Oh, please, no, please, no, it doesn't no, no, work no. because it does not work. It, and it, I think it it's very work. dangerous to take to, to even have the notion that it may help you. Um, unfortunately, those do not work. So I don't know how they get away with it. You know, I don't know how they can make these claims. But um, please don't, yeah, don't use those. Don't use those. Okay. Um, the only thing that is right now in phase three trials is uh, actually Dr. Fasano's discovery, which is a pill that would be taken. Seems like with any meal, um, and what it does is it prevents the tight junctions from opening. So, yeah, who's getting blah, 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 blah. No, I can't do that, but now you when, your tight junctions. <laughs> uh, when you eat gluten, it causes leakiness in your small intestine, and his drug would prevent that leakiness. If the leak, if there's no increase in leakiness, then the gluten can't get from the small intestine, into the underlying tissue and cause this inflammatory reaction. So that is a, a medication that is going into phase three trials. It's for this along. It's very exciting, except, and I'm saying this because I'm honest, um, that you would have to take it with before each meal, and it's only if you are accidentally cross-contaminated. It's for so, so you can't like go out. Tiny you amount. You can eat a pizza and beer. Not and, a pizzeria, or Regina right. pizza. Right. You can right. have new grist beer, and you yeah. can have your against the grain pizza. But then you don't need to take that. But there's nothing. But in case they, you know, mix it up and put it on the wrong pan or something. Yeah. So, so it's for it's for minor con uh, cross contact. minor cross con contact. There's also a vaccine that they're looking into. Um, that's very very early. It's like preclinical. It's very early, so I wouldn't expect anything for many years. Um, that is only for patients that carry HLA DQ2, um, not DQ8, and DQ2.5. So it's for a subset of patients, but again, it's very early. So there's always some new stuff that seems exciting, but right now there's one pill um, going into right. phase three studies. We should hear about that, I would say, two years, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and that's going to be the first one. So that's why CDGEM is so important because 
while there's no cure and while there's treatments that people are studying, if we can learn what happens before someone develops celiac disease, our hope is that we can then take the knowledge that we learn here and then in our next cohort study, take that knowledge and prevent it. Um, and that wouldn't be a cure, it would be ultimately preventing celiac disease and hopefully what we learn will also be able to be applied to things like type one diabetes, thyroid disease, MS, all other autoimmune diseases. Um, all right, I'd like to say thanks, Kevin, for the tight junction shout out. <laughs> um, I don't know what UW stands for, but I'm happy to discuss that further via the CDGEM email. Um, all right, if there's no other questions, I got to go to bed, and Pam and I have spent a lot of time tomorrow. together. Oh my I gosh, know, we're going to spend all day together tomorrow. And tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just kidding. Thank okay. you for all your support. Thanks for thanks for coming. Thank you so much for being part of the study. Um, I hope you know how much this means to us. Um, I have my. You guys are gonna get this too, but I have my gem. This is my progress report up here on my wall because um, I have been. I'm going on five years of working on this study, and you know it's just so important to us and. We're so thankful that you're in it. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Did he catch